Hi everybody, welcome to class 10, video 1. Uh, in this class we're going to tackle geothermal energy. And geothermal energy is important because it's totally carbon neutral. Um, there's a reasonably good supply of it. Uh, so it has a lot of potential as an energy source, but it really only works out in a few select places, um, although technology is advancing so we may be seeing more geothermal energy in years to come. So before we get started, I'll just remind you again, um, all energy that we use as electricity or anything else is integrated nuclear power. So we've already talked about solar power and wind. Now today we're going to talk about geothermal. And it's a bit unique because it's the only power source that is actually directly generated by nuclear decay within Earth's interior. So most of these other sources kind of come from nuclear fusion in the sun that trickles down through the system. But geothermal actually comes from nuclear decay in Earth's interior and is made when heat is trying to escape from the Earth. So in this class, we'll talk about radioactive heating and thermal gradients in the Earth's interior. Then we'll talk about where to harvest geothermal energy. And then we'll finish with a little bit uh, of the details about how we actually make electricity from geothermal energy. Okay, so here we've got a diagram of Earth. Uh, in orange is the mantle, in green is the crust. And both of those contain radioactive elements that decay and heat them up internally. So a couple really important elements are uranium-238, which we know has this huge decay chain, undergoes multiple alpha and beta decays, all of which release energy. Another really important element is potassium-40. This is a single beta decay, so it doesn't release as much energy per decay, but there's a lot of it. Potassium is a fairly major element, so this decay happens many, many times. Now, radioactive decay is generating a huge amount of energy. Uh, if we look at the numbers here, in the mantle, we're getting a combined production of about 13.3 terawatts, and in the crust, about 7.3 terawatts. So that's energy that's being, that's instantaneous energy that's always being made. For comparison, uh, one nuclear plant, electricity plant, makes about 0 0.0006 terawatts. So all told, Earth right now is generating as much energy as 35,000 nuclear power plants. Pretty impressive. And so the question is, can we harvest that as geothermal energy? So the way heat energy escapes from Earth is by conduction through the continental crust, or any crust. And the situation is basically that the crust acts as an insulating blanket, and it actually has a temperature of about 1250 degrees at its base, actually a little hotter than is shown here. Meanwhile, at the surface, the average temperature is maybe 20 or 30 degrees Celsius. So there's a huge difference in temperature between the base of the crust and the top of the crust. And that difference is called a geothermal gradient, OK? And what we can see is that uh, if the geothermal gradient is steeper, that means that the temperature changes faster. So we'd call that a high gradient. And we have very high gradients where the crust is thinner, for example, over thin oceanic crust. If the temperature changes a little bit more slowly, that would be called a low geothermal gradient. And that would be more typical of continental crust. So it turns out that the steepness of the thermal gradient is actually one of the main controls on how much heat energy can be lost. And that's shown here in this diagram, where we've got a hot object that's conducting heat towards a cold object over here through some given area, A. So what controls how much heat energy can come through here? Well, that's given by this equation, which is fairly simple. Um, we've got the conductivity K, the area A, and then we've got this last term, which is actually the temperature gradient. That's the difference in temperature between the hot and cold divided by the length, or L, 
So this equation, I'm only showing it to you as kind of a context or a framework where we can think about how we might get more heat flow out of a system. What in this equation could we change to make P larger? Well, there's a few things. Obviously, we could move the hot object closer, so that would make L smaller, okay, and make the heat flow bigger. Uh, we could make the area bigger, so we could increase A, which would jack up the heat flow. Or we could make the gradient bigger, so we could actually uh, make hot object minus cold object bigger. So those are some of our options, and of course, this is these are the key things that govern the uh, heat flux and then the, our ability to make geothermal energy. Okay, so let's move now into looking at where we can get these high heat fluxes on Earth. So geothermal generation generally looks at two places on Earth. One is areas of tectonic extension. So this is area where the crust is pulling apart. And as it does that, it thins. And as it thins, uh, the mantle is able to come up closer. And basically, the hot mantle is closer to the surface. So we've increased the thermal gradient in areas of crustal thinning. Okay, Those are sometimes called rifts. A second area is active volcanoes or hot spots. So here, we've literally got hot magma that's been able to make its way up to the surface through a, a plumbing network. And by virtue of having that liquid hot magma very close to the surface, well, of course, we get high thermal gradients and uh, a lot of heat flux. So volcanoes are another common place to make geothermal energy. So here's an example. Um, of some of these places shown on a, a global map. And this map shows heat flow. So red is high, purple is low. What do you notice right away? Well, we see the mid-ocean ridges here, right, in red. That's places, as we know, where the mantle is coming up almost right to the surface, and the crust is very, very thin. So the heat flow is really high. Um, we also see some volcanoes here. Uh, a lot of this stuff are subduction zones that have actually uh, active volcanoes right around them. Here's the active volcanoes of the Aleutian Islands up here too. So we see the crustal spreading and thinning and the volcanoes. And then of course under the continents, like here under the eastern US, any place we've got a stable continent that's just been sitting there for a long time, the crust is very thick and the heat flow is very, very low. So most of our continents have low heat flow. So let's zoom into the United States now and take a look. Um, this is showing geothermal gradients in the US. Uh, under the Sierra Nevada in blue, we would consider this a very low thermal gradient uh, because temperature doesn't change very much with depth. And under areas like Battle Mountain, we've got a very high geothermal gradient. Temperature changes really fast with depth. So why is that? Why do we have these differences? Well, the Sierra Nevada is a big, thick crustal root. It's a mountain range where the crust is really thick, so the, the heat gradient is pretty low. Um, under the basin and range here, this is an area of crustal extension or rifting. Um, where the crust is thinning and the mantle is coming up closer to produce those higher thermal gradients. This area, Battle Mountain, is actually the track of the Yellowstone hotspot. So this is an area where we actually have a body of magma sitting right below the Yellowstone hotspot, very close to the surface, um, and fingers of that magma plumbing are extending all through here. So this is an area where we have high thermal gradients, largely because of uh, a active hot magma beneath the surface. And of course, in the eastern US, basically no tectonics going on. So this old, thick crust is very cold. OK, so let's finish up and look at geothermal electrical generation. How do we actually make electricity from this heat flow? Well, we need three things to do this. We need um, basically a source of heat, okay, 
magma or mantle. And then what we need is actually a permeable material sitting above it. So that could be, for example, like loose sand or heavily fractured rock, something that we can pump water through. And the way these systems typically work is we inject water into this permeable material and the water circulates, mostly driven by convection. And as it does so, it heats up, okay, it, it uh, absorbs the heat from the rocks. And then eventually we pump out here either steam or very hot water. And we make steam, which then is put into uh, a steam-driven turbine to spin our electromagnetic generator and make electricity. So the key elements here are the heat and the permeable material above it. And then, of course, we need a lot of water to actually flow through that uh, hot material. So a good real life example of a successful geothermal plant is called uh, Cerro Prieto down in northern Baja, Mexico, just south of the US border. This has a roughly uh, installed capacity of 720 megawatts. That's incredibly large. That's bigger than a nuclear power plant and uh, way bigger than what you could make with solar or wind in most cases. 138 different wells where they're extracting the steam, 47 wells where they're injecting the water. So a big operation here. Geologically, Cerro Prieto is fascinating. Um, it sits down uh, near the southern end of the San Andreas Fault. Okay, so here's uh, the U.S.-Mexico border right here. This is California. And it's a little step over in, this, in the San Andreas Fault where there's a little extensional basin, a little basin that's bound on either side by normal faults or extensional faults. And into that basin, the Colorado River has come and over millions of years dumped very thick packages of sands into this basin. So here's what it looks like in cross section. All these rocks have been dropped down along faults, okay? And they've opened up this basin here. And then into that basin, this yellow sand has filled, okay? So we're gonna have a high geothermal gradient, then we're gonna be able to circulate fluids through the sand here. Um, and a truly ideal setup for making geothermal electricity. So in summary, uh, what are some of the pros and cons of making deep geothermal electricity? Well, the advantages are that there's no greenhouse gas emissions, uh, so no air pollution, no CO2, doesn't really contribute to global warming. Relatively few toxic byproducts, there's no mining, nothing crazy destructive, but, uh, and also it has a small footprint, you know, it doesn't take up too much area. But on the downside, uh, it, it, it uses a lot of water. So if you're in an arid area, you may be putting a big burden on the local water supply. Sometimes you need to fracture the rock or frack it. Um, and then quite often the fluids that come out of the ground are very briny. They're concentrated in dissolved elements and are often not suitable for disposal into the rivers or lakes. So sometimes those fluids need to be cleaned up or recycled. So is geothermal sustainable? Another interesting question. How long will it last? Well, in the very long term sense, like, you know, over millions and billions of years, it's absolutely sustainable. Um, we know the half lives of uranium and potassium are very, very long. So we're never going to deplete that heat source of uranium and potassium decay. Uh, that heat flow will continue way past our lifetimes. But in the short term, geothermal power plants reduce local heat gradients. As we're pumping that cold water in and it's absorbing up the heat energy, um, it's cooling everything down. And so overall, the heat gradients are reduced. And it takes time for the heat to conduct upwards through the hot rock and replenish that heat energy. So if you end up extracting the heat faster than it replenishes upwards by conduction,
then you're going to deplete your heat flow. Um, and that's pretty common. So here's a uh, example. This is the electrical generation of a geothermal power plant in New Zealand. So it's installed back in 1990, comes online, it's very high, and then it starts to slowly deplete down to kind of a base level. Right here in 2007, a new technology was introduced that actually doubled that production back up. But you can see that's, you know, it was making only 20% of its initial generation uh, after 10 or 12 years. So these things definitely do deplete um, on the human time scale as those gradients get lower. So I'll leave you with a concept question. There's a quiz online. And we'll do another short video about shallow geothermal. Thanks.